Dr. Rosen, it's a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to see you. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be talking to you, Lonnie. <laughs> well, you know, um, uh, you're, you're a very, very interesting guy with a, an amazing background of education and what you've done. And, and, you know, people will be able to see that, uh, you know, on our, on our bio sheet here, but, um, but I'm always intrigued with people, people's motivations is what gets them to where they are. Like what, what sort of made you decide you were going to get into medicine and science and you're going in, you know, all, you know, uh, both feet in as far as medicine and science. So, um, so tell us what are the things in your life that led you to say, this is what I want to do. This is what I want to focus on. What was your inspiration? A, my inspiration was actually the fact that I was able to combine all the aspects of my education and in a sort of a way to put them to good use. I'm a curious person by nature and I was always looking to see if I can kind of implement the things that I did in the past in the medical career that I've chosen. And I think that in the field of ophthalmology, we're very lucky in many ways because it embodies many of the things that I hold dear in the medical profession. One is the very intimate relationship that we have with our patients. Just by virtue of the exam itself, you have to be alone with the patient in the room. Uh, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes and you will have a meaningful conversation with your patient, uh, whether you like it or not. And I, of course, like it very, very much. <laughs> Second thing is that it's a surgical profession. So we do quite a lot of surgery and retinal surgery, retinal detachments, retinal membranes, uh, other things that are more uh, research oriented that we will talk about later. And it makes it fascinating for me because I do love working with my hands. I do not enjoy what it's the only thing that I do, but I definitely enjoy a lot doing that. And the third and the most important thing is that ophthalmology is basically a pioneer in research and the reason for it, and especially in retinal research, and the reason for it is very simple, is that the retina is actually a part of the central nervous system that is relatively readily accessible through retina surgery. And that cannot be said for other parts of the brain. So many things such as gene therapy and cell therapy, many new revolutionary approaches in medicine are first tried out in ophthalmology just because of the retina being so accessible and the retina surgery field being so advanced these days. So I hope that kind of answers the question. It does, and, 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 it, and I think it is a wonderful lead into what we wanna talk about your research because, in it, and I, I always find it fascinating related to how our research in ophthalmology is, is so important as it relates to the neurosciences as well. And, and I agree, this is a great fit for your background. So, um, so I know you want to share some slides with us and, and talk a little bit about your research. I, I um, please do, and and um, I, I'm I'm looking forward to it myself. All right. All right. So this is just to start, and I have to say, so this is a good place to thank both, both Dr. Sahel, my chairman and Mr. Marty McGuinn for allowing this fellowship to basically happen. And I'm very grateful for this exciting opportunity to be a part of the research here at UPMC. Terrific. Now, all right, so the first project that I'm involved with uh, is the PRIMA trial, which is basically uh, the use of artificial retina for severely uh, basically blinding retinal diseases. This trial is led by Dr. Joseph Martel in our department. And I'm lucky, very lucky to assist him, was very lucky to assist him in the surgeries that were done up, till this time, up to this day. Basically the trial involves implantation of an artificial retina uh, developed by uh, Professor Daniel Palanker from Stanford. And it's an array of photovoltaic cells that sits under the retina, as we can see here, implanted by Dr. Martel. And there is a pair of goggles that the uh, patient is wearing, and these goggles transmit uh, the visual information to the array, which in turn transmits the information to the brain. 
And this is Dr. Sahel holding one implant just to, for you to appreciate how small it is. You can see this small speck here. It's not this big circle, but rather this small speck. And this is Dr. Martel right here with myself assisting performing the implant implantation in one of the patients. This is very excited. This is the first two implants that were uh, implanted uh, in the United States. They were done here at Pittsburgh. And we're excited uh, to have more patients participate in that trial. You got to assist in that surgery. Correct, I got to assist in both surgeries and this is just uh, some pictures of the implant going in and sitting under the retina during the surgery. Next project I'm involved in is a targeted gene delivery. So gene therapy is a very popular uh, um, uh, form of therapy in inherited retinal degenerations, where you have a gene that is malfunctioning and causing a disease of the retina, causing a malfunction and ultimately degeneration of the retina. And uh, this is a particular interest of mine. And this is why I was so excited at the opportunity to work with Dr. Sahel, who is a, basically a giant in that figure, in that, uh, a giant in that field, and one of the most important scientists in the world dealing with these diseases. And uh, the most sort of ideal therapy would be gene therapy, where you take a virus and empty it of its genetic component and load it up with a correct copy of the malfunctioning gene, and then inject the virus under the retina on the, or in proximity to the retina, and basically infect the retinal cells that have an incorrect copy of the gene with a correct copy of the gene, making them function properly. Okay, and there are several modes of uh, basically of how can you uh, perform such a procedure. Uh, there are several ways to injecting into the eye. And I'm very excited to work with Dr. Leah Byrne here at UPMC, where she, uh, with uh, a collaboration with Dr. Federchak, have developed an implant that goes into the eye and basically contains these viral particles and allows us to perform a targeted delivery of the viral, par tar uh, of the viral particles to the retina of the uh, diseased individual. In this case, uh, it's a model. And what we can see here in this picture is that the gene is basically the delivered gene, which in this case was basically a fluorescent protein is being uh, expressed in the target area. And we are very excited about these results. So, Other so projects- I have a question related to the, uh, the gene delivery therapy. Is it something that not just patients with, you know, what are the conditions like retinitis pigmentosa or any inherited retinal condition potentially could yes. benefit from this? So uh, that's an excellent question. So first we're very excited that actually, so what I told you about gene therapy sounds a little bit like science fiction. So we take a virus, we empty it out of its genetic component, load it up with the correct copy, infect the retina, and there is a and there is an improvement but it's actually not. So as of last year, there's one particular disease for which such a treatment is FDA approved. It's called Luxturna, and it's approved for a disease called Leber's congenital amaurosis, which is basically a retinitis pigmentosa, which is very severe in presentation. It presents from infancy and basically results in a profound visual impairment since a very young age. Now, a, as we advance, as our, and as our understanding of inherited retinal degenerations advances, we know more and more genes that cause more and more diseases. And for every disease in essence, for which is one gene, one protein disease, meaning that we know that a particular gene is malfunctioning and this is what causes the disease, in essence, they are target, potential target for uh, gene therapy. Uh, the only caveat here is that in order for this kind of treatment to work, you need enough living cells in order to express the correct copy of the gene. So you have to catch the disease sort of early on uh, in order for this kind of treatment to work. But undoubtedly, this is one of the most exciting avenues of treatment that we have now in ophthalmology. And you have to understand that 
merely a decade ago, when a patient with an inherited retinal disease would come in the clinic, the only thing that I could offer would be basically words of encouragement. But now we're very excited that these new treatments are coming up. One is a very concrete one, and there are a lot of labs all over the world, including here at Pittsburgh, that are working on a treatment for different genes causing different inherited retinal degenerations. Thank you, that's very exciting. Absolutely, I think so. So another thing that I'm uh, working on is basically basic science uh, asking the question of what happens when we fail. So let's say we have a person that has an inherited retinal degeneration and the retina is completely gone. Will we be able to help this person uh, somehow to see or to regain some sort of visual function? And the idea here is to basically try and restore the visual function on the level of the central nervous system or the brain and this is where my experience and my PG training in uh, neurobiology comes in. And this is where I try to combine things. So first in lab animals, what you have to do is to actually quantify whether the animal is successfully seeing or not. And this is one of the device that was, uh, devices that was built in my lab. So we have basically an array of magnetic sensors and the rat has a small magnet here and it's watching this Four, these four screens surrounding it in a sort of a virtual reality situation where they're basically projecting these black and white lines that are moving around the rat. And the rats have this particular reflex that causes them to react with head movement once they see that moving across them, provided that the retina is actually able to see or the brain rather is actually able to see. This is registered on the sensors and we can provide a reliable means to quantify the visual acuity of the rat, which will basically not answer when we ask it, do you see the second letter on the third line on the right? <laughs> so yeah. that would be one very exciting project that we have. And this is just an example of some of the results that we have. So this is the head movement of the rat this is basically a curve that is designed to kind of simulate the movement of the screens. And this is their frequency coherence or kind of the compatibility in the frequency domain showing that indeed the rat was following the movement of the screen. The goal, the ultimate goal of this particular project is to create what we call a retinal bypass or basically uh, something that would allow us to sense the environment very much like the goggles that we saw in Dr. Palanker's device, but deliver the visual information directly to the brain. And the project that is currently being uh, performed at my lab involves a tea maze where the animals go left and right according to a visual stimulus and then basically get a reward if they got the uh, navigation right. After the animals, these particular animals actually that we use have a, their model for retinitis pigmentosa. They're called RCS or Royal College of uh, Surgeons Rats. And it's a very interesting story. They have a spontaneous mutation, which is also one of the mutations in humans that we know that causes retinitis pigmentosa. And they were discovered in the uh, basement or dungeons beneath the Royal College of Sur uh, Surgeons in London. Wow. So these particular rats go blind after a, particular, after a certain period. And what we try to do is to see whether we are able to cause them, to make them understand the visual clues without really seeing them, but directly delivering the stimulation to the brain. And this is an ongoing project, but we're actually very, very excited and we have promising results. The ultimate goal would be to have a sort of the device in a human where you have this particular this sensor that senses the environment like a camera uh, or it could perhaps include other modalities in it and the, having the, this information delivered directly to the central nervous system. Fantastic. Fantastic. It is really an amazing marriage of, of biological science and, neuros, and neuroscience as well as you know what you um, understand as a physician is a, is a 
clinician that, that ultimately will help benefit the patients. I think I really I really think this is crucial because I do think that the best understanding, but also the treatments and the approaches to the different type of diseases can only come from the clinical side of the aisle. And they basically, once you see the patients again and again, and you realize what kind of difficulties are we are they dealing with as a result of their condition, only then can you truly be able to see the small nuances of how are you better able to help and what are the avenues that you want to explore when trying and design a treatment or an approach to possible treatment. So all of these things you're doing, obviously, you know, uh, it, it, there's not too many places I imagine that um, offer the, um, the breadth of work that allow you to conduct this type of research with in collaboration with, with people who are, um, you know, expert in all these areas. Is, is Pittsburgh unique in that way? Is that one of the reasons you came to Pittsburgh or, or what, tell us what the, the you know, the, the, uh, the benefits are to you um, in terms of, um, of doing this work here in Pittsburgh. Absolutely. I think that Pittsburgh is, first of all, I have, I have to admit that I have not heard of Pittsburgh before I actually met Dr. Sahel at one of the conferences and we discussed a little bit about the research going on here. And I think that Pittsburgh is an amazing hub of research and technology, which is kind of off the radar of many people. And uh, what is going on here is simply nothing short of amazing. And the, the new institute that Dr. Sahel is in the process of forming will actually bring together basic scientists on one hand and clinician on, clinicians on the other hand, creating this unique integrative approach that I was talking about that basically is lacking in my view in many places in the world. And Pittsburgh is extremely unique and I think also extremely fortunate to have this approach brought and delivered and developed by uh, UPMC and Dr. Sahel. Well, you know, I, I thank you so much. And, and you really are, um, we're, we're really uh, very fortunate to have someone who's at this point in terms of where you're developing and growing in your own career, applying so much of this to, to the work that's going on here. Um, and, uh, and I know that the work that you're doing, even beyond your fellowship, whether you, you know, uh, wherever that may be, you'll, you'll always have this tie in this collaboration with what you're doing here in Pittsburgh. And that's also part of the goal in terms of the future. Our goal is to try to ultimately help patients with these conditions. And we know that that's something that needs to be done on a, a collaboration that's, a, that's at a scale that would be, you know, um, on a, on a international scale. As, as Absolutely. Opposed to just Absolutely. And I'm, I'm, I'm very fortunate. I consider myself to be very fortunate to have this opportunity and I'm very grateful for being afforded such an amazing opportunity to advance my research, advance my training and to combine all the things that I wish to combine in my own career. Well, thank you. It is always so nice to see you. So um, we'll look forward to more opportunities, but um, you take care of yourself and, and um, have a wonderful day. And uh, thank you, we'll you look forward to, so to catching up with you again soon. Absolutely, look forward to it.